how, under what yeah, circumstances? Yeah, I can't be very precise, but it would have been the late 60s, and it would have been at the Little Theatre Club, which is now taking on, you know, the, the, the more time passes, the more mythical it becomes, but it was actually a, a room that was incredi incredibly full if there were 20 people there. And uh, I, we see how much things have changed. Uh, <laughs> um, in fact, there were rarely 20 people there. Usually there was one or two people there to listen, sometimes more than that to play. But uh, uh, the, the founder of the music program at the Little Theatre Club, the guy that put it together was uh, the drummer, the late John Stevens. And uh, John was sort of my protege, as it were, introduced me to the scene. And as I, as I mentioned before, uh, Barry arrived, so we can check if he feels this is accurate. Uh, Trevor Watts, was, was, uh, who'd been in the RAF with John Stevens, was, was uh, sort of Barry's protege. And Barry was a student at the Guildhall at that time. And I was uh, living on the moral learnings of my wife, I think. <laughs> Accurate. Well, yeah, I think that sounds pretty accurate. Yes, Tre Trevor Watts and um, Paul Rutherford were my two um, sponsors, so to speak. I, um, I was doing some evening classes at Goldsmiths College in composition. I had a, to write a piece for the end of uh, end of the year, and um, the saxophone player in my ensemble was a chap called Bernard Living with Mike Westbrook band and uh, but he he at some point decided because the piece was a bit difficult he was going to conduct it so we needed a an alto player I knew Rutherford from where I lived in South East London and Blackheath and uh, I knew where to find him in the pub normally next to the fireplace with a pint on the top there so I went to the three tons in Blackheath found Rutherford immediately and um, we had a, had a discussion and I said look if you come play the trombone, can you get Trevor Watts to um, to join us as well? And there was a little cadenza, so-called cadenza. This was all sort of pre pre run of the London Jazz Composers Orchestra pieces, I guess, because I was always writing music and having imp improvised music infiltrate the, the structures. So these two really took off. I joined them uh, in a trio within this piece. About a week and a half later, two weeks later, I got the call from John Stevens, and and John said, uh, Trevor. Uh, said you, you can play the bass a bit, so perhaps, perhaps you'd like to join us with a, a spontaneous music ensemble at the Little Theatre Club. And, and uh, I thought, what well, magnificent. So this is where I came into the fold, so to speak. But I came in with a very strange, um, mis well, not misgivings, but worries, because I didn't know anything really <coughs> about this music, because uh, before that I was just involved with some modern modern jazz things and uh, some swing music and, uh, and if we go further back, you know, um, uh, we, Benny Goodland stuff and if we go even further back, Dixie Band. So I came with a sort of a lot of baggage in a way. So suddenly to be thrown into this, these create, this creative cauldron was quite, quite uh, intense and I was wondering whether I'd made the right move. I mean, it wasn't exactly a move to get up there, up there but just to be faced with it was, it was sort of in my mind, it was sort of contentious. And everybody, and what I remember is that everybody had opinions. It was very, very strong. Stevens had opinions, Rutherford had opinions, and Evan had opinions. So after the, after the gigs, quite often we, we, we would, uh, there would be quite a discussion afterwards, which could be, could get quite heated and uh, I think as time went on with the spontaneous music ensemble sometimes you were in and sometimes you were out so the phone call will come through Barry uh, don't bother coming up this week mate. <laughs> <laughs> this, is John this is John Stevens so you know uh, uh, what's the problem John um, uh, didn't like the way you played <laughs> so, get on with life again you know then then a few weeks later Call will come and says, Do you want to come up? Come up. <laughs> All right, okay, I'll come there. And then the, what, what, the amazing thing about the Little Theatre Club was that there was the chance to meet other musicians who were coming through town. And um, uh, this is where I met Howard Riley, who, became, who was at uh, was Indiana University, 
been at Bangor University, went to Indiana to uh, to study with um, 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 Russell, with the Lydian concept or something, and the, George, he, George, George Russell, George Russell, George Russell, Russell yeah, and yeah, he can see everybody knows everybody, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> brain gone, and um, he came back, came out to the little theatre club, and he, I think, did have a piano there. Was there a piano? Yeah, that was a band. Bad upright, and I think we. So this is where we started playing together. So there, so there were little splinter bands sort of happening, and then there was. I think one of the occasions uh, where the spontaneous music ensemble had one of these sort of eruptions, and I ended up. I seem to end up in the trio with uh, Trevor Watts and Paul Rutherford, called Malvern. So that was another thing that happened, and then and that in itself developed into Iskra 1903 with Derek Bailey, because Derek was playing with the Contents Music Ensemble. But, but just just pull back a little bit first for us. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah, I know it's like we could get us straight through here. here. But yeah, yeah. I think I think what I'm particularly interested in is 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 where your head's at when you're a young musician and. There are choices to be made about what sort of music you'll play, and it's a rarefied decision to choose to play, to, to choose the avant-garde. And I'm wondering, what do you think was acting on you uh, at that time? I mean, you mentioned Beckett earlier on in your... Yeah. And, and Evan also mentioned Beckett when I was interviewing him for the paper. And I'm wondering what kind of attitudes and ideas were acting on you guys then, as young men, that drove you towards the avant-garde. Evan, do you have a was art school? Yeah, types? yeah. Well, you know, the, the the problem with this kind of situation is you you start repeating your own stories, <laughs> and uh, they get more and more solidified and more more and more polished up, and uh, have perhaps a little less to do with the truth each time you tell them. But but uh, I'll try and be accurate. Uh, I was in Birmingham. I had, I've just re written about this again, so it's fairly clear in my mind. I was in Birmingham. I had three gigs a week with a, a, a quartet, uh, saxophone, piano, bass, and drums. We were playing repertoire from uh, Coltrane Records, doing our best to sound like uh, John Coltrane and... Uh, Which Elvis. Coltrane Records? Oh, I, I had quite a few. I mean, which period? Like the easy bit. <laughs> <laughs> There's an easy bit. <laughs> relative. It's all relative. After giant steps, a little bit, you know, the etude period of right. Coltrane, difficult changes. Um, they went into, let's say, implied difficult changes, which I'm quite good at. <laughs> <laughs> because nobody can say whether it's right or, or wrong. <laughs> um, but the the mo loosely speaking, the modal period, although that doesn't really let's say post my favourite things. That was a core core piece in our repertoire. Uh, only two scales. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we're glad we cleared that one up. Okay, so, so that was my th three gigs a week were Friday night at the university. I'd, I'd been uh, uh, required to terminate my studies about uh, three years before that. We, we, we st were still using the facilities there. Oh, but you were doing botany, weren't you? Yes. That's what you were studying, wasn't you? Well, there's a story about that as well. That was extremely polished up. Friday night was uh, at the university, Saturday afternoon was in a, play, a drinking club uh, the, in the days when you needed uh, a license to sell drink out of, you know, you had to be a club member to oh, yeah. have a drink in, in the afternoon oh. and that was a place called the Grotto, oh, very yeah. famous for uh, afternoon drinking but uh, the people there didn't mind much about the music, as long as they could get their drink. <laughs> and then the third distinguished gig was, was Sunday evening. This is polished up as well. Uh, Sunday evening was a place called the Elbow Room, and we played uh, opening set, warm-up set for Jim Capaldi's rock band. Jim Capaldi later hooked up with uh, traffic. traffic. So, but uh, at eight o'clock, there was nobody there except the people behind the bar, 
us on the bandstand and Shirley Bassey on the television. <laughs> because at the other end of the room, they didn't see any reason to turn the television off just because we were messing about. <laughs> and, uh, so I've, I've made the polished bit is that um, it's not only Derek Bailey that played with Shirley Bassey early on. You know, <laughs> also played with Shirley. So that that was my luminous uh, professional circumstances that I left behind me in order to investigate the streets of London paved, as everybody knows, with gold. And it was quite a come down, I can tell you. Pounds, shillings, and pence we had still in those days, and the pence were quite a considerable. Uh, element of the uh, payment that you could expect at the end of the night at the little theatre club. Um, so that was it. But the, the, the st to answer your story, yes. <laughs> um, when I was do still doing that uh, uh, modern jazz, I had the offer to make some music for an, a, a film by, by a guy at the Royal College of Art who was it was a science fiction film. I used to say that it was based on Fahrenheit 451 or whatever the story, the Ray Bradbury story. But it wasn't. It turned out it wasn't. So if you read anywhere in the history that it was that, it wasn't. It was just a, a more generalized view, view of the future, a sort of what we call now a dystopian future. And uh, it needed dystopian music, and who else could provide that except me? <laughs> Mr. Dystopian. It was a revelation. First of all, the piano player said, I have got no idea what you mean, futuristic music. The drummer said, No, I can't do that. So, but the bass player said, Hmm, that sounds interesting. Um, and we, we made uh, saxophone and bass music. Weird, deliberately weird. This is so, this is music in the future. And then it left me with a lot to think about. If, uh, if I'm imagining this music, why is it futuristic? And I leave that open as a, a question for us all to speculate. <laughs> what date was that? Um, that would have been about 1966, I suppose. Right. But I suppose the, the, my question had been, like, where were you getting? You, well, I never finished. You, I'll, I'll finish yes. it now, having left it open for you to speculate for all <laughs> ten seconds. <laughs> so, um, John Stevens also had a friend uh, with a diploma show, uh, the same end of year diploma show, or end of uh, the degree course show that was the, the thing at the Royal College of Art, and uh, Alfreda Bench, the wife of Robert Wyatt knew John Stevens and she knew the filmmaker that I made the music for. They, they collaborated on projects as well. So Alfreda told John, go and have a listen to that uh, film because there's some interesting music. And then we were introduced and then John said, I'm going to start a club. 1966, yeah, I'm going to start a club later in the year. I'll, you know, come down. And that was it. Originally he had the idea that I should play with uh, a different bass player and a different drummer, but it, it it sort of turned into me playing with John, and that was a very important moment in my life. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you well, all. I'm, not, I'm not sure if that answers the question though about where does the was there a the question? <laughs> <laughs> the decision to to the avant-garde, like, wait, did you think you plucked that out of the air? What the futurist of music would sound like? What I knew was that there was already somebody doing Coltrane's job. It was not available. <laughs> much, much as I would like, like to have been John Coltrane, I had to come to the sad conclusion that I'd have to be myself and uh, find out where that led. And that's where it led. It led me to the uh, Little Theatre Club and John Stevens and Barry Guy and that whole moment, which you could neatly call a sort of uh, Big Bang kind of moment with all these particles colliding, individuals and f groups fracturing and coming together and exploding again. It was a very, very react, a, a period of uh, great action and reaction. 
What about you, Barry? What did, do you have a sense of what drew you towards more abstract sounds? At some point, I, I when I was taking uh, these compositional on composition classes at Goldsmiths College, um, I was introduced to the so-called straight music uh, because they were it was composition classes, and so for the first time I heard Penderecki, the first time I heard. Um, um, uh, Stockhausen, Ligeti, and uh, and uh, John Cage, of course. So there was uh, the, the door was opening to, which was kind of it was interesting. You could see the light through there. I had, I had not the clue of what it was all about because it just sounded quite chaotic to me. But on on the other hand, you know, over a year, if you listen to it enough, or oh, I think it was a year and a bit, um, things started to form about sound and. Uh, and possi sound possibilities. And we were also encouraged to play. Um, Bernard Living, I mentioned already in our conversation earlier, Bernard Living, uh, alto saxophone player that played with Mike Westbrook eventually. Um, but he, he was a, a funny chap. He seemed to know everything about the American avant-garde. Um, this is when we were schoolboys. We were at school, 14, 14 15 year old. He knew all about the Mont Young and the John Cage School, uh, all of the paintings, the photographers. God knows where he got and all this. This is at a time when this information was very hard to access. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And I don't know where he got it from, but he was uh, he was prodding me, you know. And because I remember we were playing in our little uh, schoolboy uh, Dixieland band, and he walked in with a Charles Mingus record, and uh, for, and we used to do our, our little rehearsals at lunchtime, playing you know whatever pieces of Dixieland. And, they said, we should play this, and there was suddenly a great uproar. Half the band said, we're not playing that shit, you know, so... <laughs> <laughs> and Bernard said, yeah, we're going to, let's try it out, let's try it out. And I said, well, put it on the record player then. So I put it on the record player, and there was an almighty f fight after, after that, you know, we're not playing, we're not playing. The record player ended up on the floor, the record <laughs> on the floor and everything. Then the music teacher came in, said, what's going on here? And by, the by them, we were actually beating each other. <laughs> <laughs> and did you recognize then that you were on the side of the angels, as it were? It was. I, I mean, the first time I heard uh, the, this Charles Mingus record, I thought, this is mysterious stuff, but powerful. It, for me, it was, it was somebody had grabbed me, you know? And I thought, what, the, what are we doing with this Dixieland stuff? But so, so, you know, you just have these fortuitous moments in your life. And then it kind of all started to connect up when I went to the, uh, these evening classes at Goldsmiths College because I started he hearing about other musics outside the European so-called modern contemporary music, whatever. And then, uh, th then it was sort of backtracking to find out who, what, what the Mingus got to do with this. So it's actually disentangling a lot of information. And I suppose when, when I got up, the first uh, occasions up at the Little Theatre Club, these guys were talking about Hornet and Dolphy and, and, and Coltrane and Cecil Taylor. And had you heard that stuff at that point? Um, I heard some bits. I think the, the, the thing that really, after Mingus, the thing that really um, grabbed me hard and I couldn't quite shake it off was, um, was um, Albert Tyler. The first time I heard the, the, uh, the trio with Gary Peacock, and, is it Blackwell, wasn't it? No, Sonny Murray. Sonny Murray, sorry. And, uh, and I thought, oh, this is the most extraordinary way of playing. And, and I, I didn't come through the Coltrane route. I sort of jumped. I suddenly was there with, with uh, Isla. And I thought this was a amazingly emotional music. And it's, that's why I, you know, this, I had this, I was in the grip of it. And, um, and it was mysterious and, and a big question mark at the same time. But it's, it was something I couldn't leave alone. So w when I got to know these guys, and I was pretty late on the scene, because these fellows had been working a bit at the little theatre club, I was sort of a new boy on the block. So I had a lot of catching up to do. But you know, it's amazing. Uh, the energy and the information that was passed down was, uh, if there was any doubts, you would be pushed along and, uh, by the, the collective in a way. And that, it, you know, it was, it was a discussion group as well. You know, it wasn't just a matter of just going up there and playing and disappearing. It, it was, it was, there were some quite hard um, analytical sessions, I remember, to find out who did what, when and, and how. And, 
the you mean looking back at the music that you play, discussing it afterwards? Yeah, there were some round table things in a pub up there, or wherever it was, or the day before. Perhaps we will come back the next day or something and, and uh, analyse what happened last night or something. So it was a, it was a mixture of, of, of um, discovery and discussion. But all, all the time, I said, everybody had their own opinions about how it, how it, how it could go. And, and you form, and one formed alliances with people. You felt on one side for one moment, and then you would kick the other side. But it was a, it was a great learning curve, I must say. Yeah. And th so, in terms of non-musical input that you were getting, I mean, you both mentioned Beckett to me uh, recently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How does that translate into music? And how does something like Beckett or or what was happening in the visual arts? How does that influence you? Well, I, I've certainly, from my point of view, I, I found out. Um, first about Beckett was my English teacher who was Irish. Uh, he, he told me about Beckett and, and Shakespeare. And, uh, this is when we were 13, 14 years <coughs> old. We were actually taken to, uh, to London to see things. This is when schools had enough money to take you on a school journey to, to enjoy something. You know, because you know, we were in a working, working class district, so not much was going on there really in terms of culture. So we would be taken up to London to see, see things. So that's the first I heard of it. The next time Beckett surfaced was uh, at York University. And I got to know some uh, composers up at York University and I played an ensemble there with Bert Grants and, um, and uh, there was quite a few composers there. And they all seemed to be referring to Beckett and Joyce. This, is, this was, I think, there was an Italian connection there as well. They're all mixed up with Berio and and uh, and the Italian music, and they all seemed to have a connection with Beckett. So I got slightly fascinated in this name again, and and uh, to the extent that actually I wrote to Beckett after a while, I having read a lot of his stuff, I wrote him a card because I was doing some recitals, music theatre recitals. So I asked him for a piece if he if you could do me a, a little scenario, uh, a song without words, because I'm, 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 I can't remember text very well, so all I wanted to do was to, was to loon around in a costume or something with some, in some Beckettian um, scenario with lights and bass. So, but it was found after his death in, in a big box. Uh, so you never heard from him? Never heard from him, but it, it was there, because Eddie Beckett yeah. rang me up and said, I found your card. <laughs> <laughs> so, but th by then, you know, the, 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 uh, it was out, out of the bag, you know, I, would just wa I just wanted to follow everything that Beckett did, because he, he in some, some ways I found it, what, a bit like the music, it was, it was almost elusive, you're always being dragged further and further and further into the, the subject, you know, cause getting your hand on it sort of thing. That's how it felt in those days. Yeah. Evan, you said to me when we were talking um, a couple of weeks ago that you felt that Beckett's relationship to Joyce was similar to your own relationship to... No, no, that was the spin you put on. Well, no, in <laughs> fairness, it was not. It was you, that, anyway. I, I demand uh, a replay. <laughs> yeah. Where are the tapes? But prove it, prove what, it. What, what I'm interested in is, uh, like, I'm the most modest person you will ever meet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, tell me this then. How, how, does, how does Beckett influence a musician? This is what I'm interested in. Is how does that translate into a, an approach to music? Becoming aware of that. You know there's a vision. Relationship with work that's already been done. And there's a transitional period where you're not sure whether you, you, you need to show that you understand the work that's already been done or whether, you, whether you're whether you ready to, to do something that hasn't been done. <coughs> and to that extent, Beckett's very early stuff, you can, you can see that he's struggling with, with, well, we have people here better literary uh, <coughs> critics than I, I am, but to let's say some of the early stuff was in the shadow of, of, of James Joyce and the, the relationship with James Joyce's daughter and all of this is very was a complicated period in, in Beckett's life I think um, but he worked through that and came out the other end of that having shed that influence and, and 
even uh, started to work on shedding his, the influence of his own early work on his middle period work, and then shedding the influence of his middle period work on his, you know, he was a most rigorous artist in, in a way that um, somebody who earns a living uh, playing the saxophone in front of an audience in real time cannot be that rigorous. So I would never, never really uh, claim to have the integrity, the artistic integrity that Beckett showed in, in, in his life and his life's work. Impossible. I think there might be some people in the room here that disagree with that, um, I suspect. Well, they're very polite. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by that? What do you mean rigorous? I think the essential difference is that, that a writer has the chance to revise and tear up and destroy and come back and think again. When you, you're involved in real-time performance, then it's a warts and all kind of presentation where the, the things you would rather have not happened uh, are part of what you've presented. And um, okay, as long as the the uh, proportion of m material that you're happy with is 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 in some kind of same relation to the stuff that you're not happy with, then okay, that's that's taken as um, a condition of the form that you've chosen to work in. But it it, it can never have the rigor of of somebody who has the opportunity and the appetite for revising and editing and and completely throwing stuff away which Beckett had you know the the, the famous chest of, of writings that uh, people are still looking at you know uh, let's hope there's there's stuff in there and the estate can be persuaded and blah 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 they, they, I mean I think he, Beckett himself said no no the the barrel has been scraped, there's nothing left. But uh, I think there must be more material. Yes. Well, that does raise then the, the, the question of, uh, Barry, the, the relationship between composition and improvisation. Mm. I mean, you presented today some, uh, some of your compositions. Mm. How, do they, how do they relate to one another for you? And which, which has primacy, as it were? Do you mean in the compositions? Uh, well, well, I'm going to come to them because Evan talks about the, the, that there's a relationship between composition and improvisation that they're almost the same thing. Well, they can, they can, they can come from the same head. Yeah. Uh, whether you're writing on a piece of paper, there's just different speed of it coming out, and also the, but the same head is thinking uh, in a in a creative manner to uh, either do it spontaneously or do it through a system or a structure or architecture that is preconceived. Um, it's, a, it's a thorny old problem because uh, it's... I remember with, with, the, with the start of the London Jazz Composers Orchestra, th this was always a, a big discussion point and uh, to the point where the people got very angry about having to read all, all this notes and bar lines and the conductor and all that sort of stuff. And, um, but you know that was that was I, I had this interest and uh, almost a condition that I wanted to find ways that where improvisation could be structurally strong within actually almost make the composition. So it was a, it was a matter of informing yourself about of players and players <coughs> way players could possibly react. So it was a it was a it was a waiting game in a way. So you put some things on paper and you would hope that would be the right be the right catalyst for for the guys in the band and it wasn't always um, we had some horrendous times there people getting losing their tempers and uh, um, shouting at Buxton or the conductor and oh even I've got rehearsal tapes and I, I God knows how we pulled the piece off ever but um, there, a saintly man Buxton or yes uh, <laughs> a saintly conductor and uh, but um, I think with the I, I'm, I'm interested in composition. I'm interested, interested in structure. It's, it's, it, 
it's I mean, just in an architecture, building things and seeing how, how one space influences another, how one space gives way to another, uh, how you, when you walk into a, uh, into a room or you traverse this wheel and see you're passing counters, you're passing fires, you're going into another room there. Everything is closing and opening up. And I, there is, for me, there was uh, a discipline to be reckoned with uh, in music that, you know, I just, I like working at it. But I loved improvising because the, the, the characters that I had met at the little theatre club and that club got bigger and bigger, or the, the musicians got uh, wider and wider, were all influential. And, and what, every time we did something, say with the LJCO, I would, it would be uh, terrifying in one way, but euphoric in another. So there was always that next stage to say, okay, so that didn't work, what about trying this? Then you do something again, then you modify it a bit, try and, try and make the, uh, the, the composing part a little bit easier. It's, it's, it's uh, sort of be, becoming aware over a very, very long period of time. But it's the same with the improvisation, the way you learn to listen to your colleagues. It's the same, same idea of, of, uh, of immersing yourself in their world as well as your own. I mean, it can't be, it's not a singular activity. It's particularly in improvisation, as we all know as musicians, that you're relying on the humility and the, and the and sensitivity and the creativity of your colleagues. Well, could, can I just yeah. butt in and clarify my, my position? Uh, for me, to oppose improvisation and composition is a category error, quite plain and simple. Uh, to compose is to put together, and there are various ways in which you can put to get stuff together. Uh, putting stuff together on paper allows the possibility of editing. Putting stuff together in real time by improvising and interacting has other advantages, but not the advantage of editing and rethinking things. That only comes in the course of coming back to the same combination of players, say, or the similar situations where you can try different, different approaches. So for me, it, it makes sense to talk about uh, both activities, uh, playing notated music and improvising as forms of composition. And the clarification comes next. How was this composition made? It was made by improvising? No, it was made by notation and rehearsal, or as is very often the case in a lot of uh, improvised music con concerts, some amalgam or mixture, hybrid of those two approaches. It's, it's not uh, impossible to combine those two approaches. As Barry shows with the, the, the uh, life's work of the London Jazz Composers Orchestra, or some of his comp compositions for small groups are designed for particular players to play the notated elements and then improvise. It's, uh, you know, the theme and variations aspect that's been there for a long time. And uh, maybe the hybrid form is the one that we, we actually all feel most comfortable uh, in, in describing as... No, the, I can't finish that sentence. <laughs> It's, that's all. I think it's, it, it clarifies things if you don't oppose the idea of improvising versus composition, but, but clarify it in that way. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you both a little bit about, you, you both play uh, solo a lot, but you also play a lot of uh, ensemble playing. And I wondered uh, if you could kind of talk about the difference between those two spaces. Well, Evan, you've probably done more solo playing than I have. Um, you have developed a particular way of uh, technique, saxophone technique, that actually kind of deals with uh, with that, and that's been an exciting for me, for me as the observer of this. It's been an exciting um, year, few years, quite a few years now, hearing that develop and where you can get to. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a it, it, it's a magnificent achievement to be able to get your instrument to sound so, uh, ah, well, so contrapuntal, a tube to, to, to uh, deliver us so many 
uh, lines. So every time I hear Evan, after if I haven't seen him for six months or nine months or something, we go, I hear him again, and there's some new strand which has come in there, which he's been working on. So I think this is this goes back to again <coughs> about the idea of working away at your composition or at your procedures, about your your thought processes. And um, I know Evan works a lot to to refine these these possibilities. <coughs> and um, I think. If it's it just well, I've I've said that about you, lad. Um, I, I think from the, from the from playing the bass solo um, concerts, I, I've kind of been, I've been oh, probably in the early days it was a mixture of straight pieces which were written for the double bass and improvisation. So I was kind of fascinated with the sounds that composers were coming up with for basses. There was a, there was a kind of golden period around about uh, the early 70s where all sorts of composers were writing pretty, pretty loony things for the bass and uh, some of them really difficult, but um, which was a, an amazing opportunity and honor actually that he gave me time to take a piece that he had written. I had tried to uh, work out a way of playing it. So I visited him in Paris a couple of times and he came to London. Da, 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 da. So we worked on on exactly what it meant, this piece. It, it, because um, this was a through composed piece of music, but I felt there was something else beyond that. And it was to do with the intention. And I actually got it out of him in the end. He said, you know, you can be more flexible than it shows on the page because it came out of a com computer. It was all to do with the Brownian movement and gas pressures and all that sort of stuff, and uh, and glissandi, which were always in a state of flux. And um, but I felt there was something else because I was getting something out of it. I wasn't quite sure what it was, so I went to Paris and asked him about it. And he told me I played it, played it like a pile of shit to start with, and then I went back again and took more of it. And he said, "I think you're getting it now," but I wanted to find out from him what flexibility I had within the piece, and um, and actually I had the, even the temerity to suggest to him there's another way of notating it. That didn't go down well. But Mr. Zanakis <laughs> shut me up at that point. Maestro uh, Sinarchus. No, no. So I, I, I wanted to do it with graphic notation, you see. I was suggesting an easy way for me to play it, but no, no, no. But anyway, we, we finally got to grips with the piece, and that was a fascinating uh, moment for me because it almost felt like an improvisation. He had written it, it was all written down to very complex formulas, but there was a. There was a a window you had to sort of fly through to see the sun on the outside, you know. And this, there was the piece, and it, it was actually meant something that felt as if I was improvising. But this was a seriously written piece, and there was a lot of other pieces who were, who were influenced by that that uh, sort of methodology. Uh, yeah. yeah, I wanted to talk about t uh, two such pieces. Uh, one is um, what be the material that came out of. Uh, Bar Phillips's uh, relationship with solo playing. Uh, there was a composer colleague of Bar's in New York who asked him to make some recordings that he would then edit into a piece, which of course is great parallels with your relationship with Bernard Rands, who was basically asking the same thing of you, show me your stuff and I'll organize it for you. And. Uh, the, the, the irony is that um, the unedited material, uh, let's say the Max Schubel record disappeared without trace, but the unedited version of the material that uh, Barr later released as the Je, Journal Violone, or uh, how do you say it, Violone? Je, Je, Journal Violone, Violone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Volume 1, is still in print as far as I know and is, is considered to be perhaps the first document of uh, <coughs> solo free improvisation. There's, there's very interesting uh, ironies, complex ironies there I think, but um, there, there was also the feeling at precisely that time that, uh, wait a minute, uh, what's going on here? This, I'm evolving this material and you're, you're appropriating it and putting the seal of the maestro composer on material that you you don't even know exists until I show you that it's in the instrument. And uh, 
well, that became a kind of uh, running um, battle, I suppose you'd say. Well, it, mm. talk, talking about what's in the instrument, one of the things I was driving at there was that when you play in an ensemble, there's interaction and there, in an improvisatory setting, there's things to play off. When you're playing on your own, what, wh where do you go and what do you find? And, and Barry, I think this is what you were referring to in terms mm. of the, the mm. sort of polytonality that, mm, yes. that yeah. Evan is yeah. going for. Yeah. Evan, explain what, who you're talking to when well, you're on stage. Well, you know, that th this is also fairly well polished because uh, now the people, are, the doctorates are flying out of every, every university on the planet, it seems. And uh, that's the one place where you... Uh, um, an imp a would-be improviser can uh, spend time, um, sequestered time, uh, as long as they come out with a doctorate at the end of it, what they get up to in the rest of the time, it, usually they, they're advancing their career as improvising musicians, but okay. So there's quite a lot of uh, polished answers, or apparently polished. Well, why don't you give us one? Of them? <coughs> well, <laughs> I resemble that remark. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.